It's a great uh, pleasure to have uh, Professor Vaughan Jones uh, with us today, uh, following the series of uh, uh, special lectures we call Magna Conference, uh, financed privately, which we are very proud of that. And uh, he uh, is a very uh, broad uh, mathematician. I will say very few words about him. But uh, besides uh, a very broad mathematician, uh, he's also very broad uh, geographically. In fact, uh, he was born in New Zealand got his PhD in the University of Geneva, and uh, then went to uh, uh, Berkeley, the University of California, and now it's at uh, Vanderbilt University, if I'm not uh, wrong. So that shows uh, another kind of uh, universality. Well, uh, he uh, was awarded the Fields Medal in 1990 and is also a sir uh, by the Queen of uh, uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, his work, uh, his main work is on Van Neumann algebras, not polynomials and mathematical physics. On not polynomials, uh, uh, his work was from uh, an expected direction with oranges in the theory of Van Neumann algebras. It led to the solution of a number of classical problems in not theory. That classically, it was considered to be a topological uh, uh, question. And uh, it made it to increase uh, a lot, the interest in low dimension topology. Please, Professor Jones. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I'd like to. Oh, I forgot the title. You oh. can give the title. <laughs> the title is something like Subfactors, Knots, and Three Manifolds. So, Thank you all for coming along to listen. And uh, I'd like to thank whoever it was who had the crazy idea to invite me. Um, I just received an invitation out of the blue, but I, I know that these never things take a long time to evolve. So whoever it was, thank you very much. Um, I sort of painted myself into a corner with this title and the, the way the talks are split up. So I've been... This is actually a talk that I've been trying to figure out how to give for about 25 years, and I've never been happy with it. Um, so I decided this time, you know, it's this sort of, this magna talk made a big impression on me. Magna, you know, I remember a bit of Latin, so um, I feel a little bit intimidated, and I felt like I really needed to give a good talk here. So it's, I, I'm been a bit nervous and, and so on, so I decided to give a totally new approach to this talk um, to get around the difficulty of starting with subfactors, and then by 15 minutes most of the audience is lost and by 30 minutes the rest are probably asleep. Um, so I'm going to start with the, start with knots, which are nice and easy to warm up with, and then we'll get towards subfactors at the end with a totally new uh, definition of uh, subfactor. Um, and I've had some very sage advice from Alberto Grunbaum that, that the main point of the talk is actually that the speaker uh, is enjoying himself. And uh, this is something I generally don't have any trouble try doing, so I'll do my best to enjoy myself giving the talk. I apologize for not speaking Portuguese. I've been trying very hard to learn Spanish uh, recently, and, and I think I've made a whole lot of progress, but I stopped well short of trying to uh, 
go up one level to Portuguese. So, <laughs> all right. So as I said, I want to start with knots. <clears throat> so knots is a, it's a wonderful uh, topic in mathematics, and it, it sort of is or should be the envy of uh, most other branches of mathematics because it has the extraordinary property that you can actually draw a picture of every of all of the main uh, objects that you're talking about. So, by definition, a knot is a smooth, uh, a smooth uh, embedded uh, circle in uh, three. So, you know, R3 is what we know about. That's what we live in, so that's very nice. And uh, we can actually, and smooth is, is just smooth in some parameterization. Um, so we can actually draw pictures of these knots. And uh, every knot theorist should have uh, in his pocket a few knots that he can draw. This is the easiest one. Well, actually, this isn't the easiest one. There's, a, there's an easier one, which is just that. And that gets to be called the unknot. Because it doesn't have any sort of uh, knottiness uh, to it. Um, so there you are. Any knot can be, uh, you can imagine drawing a picture of any knot. So if you take a smooth curve in three space, then you can just imagine projecting it down onto the plane and just remember which string you saw first, and you'll get a picture like this called a knot, knot diagram. And it's a remarkable thing about um, three and two dimensions that the, this knot has now become a two-dimensional object. It started out, its life, its, it, its real self is a three-dimensional object, but by slapping it onto the plane like this, it's become a two-dimensional object and indeed, in some sense, a, an element of uh, two-dimensional uh, combinatorics, um, as we'll see. Uh, one, perhaps one word about R3, I could equally well um, put the knots in the three-sphere S3 because the only difference between R3 and S3 is just a point at infinity and any manipulations of knots that you want to do, you can just avoid that point at infinity. So everything is equivalent in uh, R3 or S3. And S3, of course, has the advantage of being compact. It's what you know, what the kind of three manifold that we'll be talking about later on. So you can alternatively think of knots in R3, which is very familiar, or S3, which is just one extra point. All right, as I said, um, a knot theorist is supposed to have a few knots up his belt, so here's a few more. Um, That's a nice one, isn't it? This one is called the trefoil. Knots, of course, have a have a many um, lives, and one of their lives is actually is a very practical life as um, knots tied in rope and used to tie um, boats to moorings and uh, all kinds of things, uh, sewing and all that kind of stuff. So the simplest knots have common names. This is called the figure figure eight or figure of eight. Because that particular drawing doesn't like doesn't look much like an eight, but you could draw another one so that it is. This, this knot is the one that is used uh, uh, by sailors a lot. To if you just have a a length of rope and you want to tie it off so that it doesn't flap around so much, then you just tie the end in this figure of eight, and it has a fantastic physical property that uh, it doesn't get stuck. You can always untie it fairly easily. Uh, here's another nice one. That's quite a pretty knot. I don't know whether it really has a, a name unless you look it up under the, in the, the Ashley Book of Knots, which is sort of the, the knot tires Bible. Um, knots also have a decorative life, and this particular one uh, can be found on some uh, Roman uh, buildings as, uh, in, in the tiling somewhere. And now I want to prove that I'm enjoying myself by uh, drawing another knot, which 
uh, it's a bit more complicated, so here it is. Whoa. This is a very difficult job, actually. I, to, I think I just have to start again. There you go. That's, a, that's another knot. It's a more complicated one. You'll notice that this one has 11 crossings. It actually would have a role to play in the story I'm telling, but I probably won't have time for it. So if anyone wants to know why this particular knot is, is of interest, um, ask me afterwards. I can tell you right now that it does have a name. It's called the Conway Knot. After John Conway, of course, who, was much, who dabbled in knot theory, um, actually, fairly more than dabbled, he's quite serious knot theorist, and was more famous for inventing the game of life, and perhaps the, even more significantly, the Conway group. All right, so there you go. That's knots. Um, they have uh, multiple versions. They have these uh, so-called links. And a link is just a, a link is just a knot with maybe more than one component. So, for instance, uh, well, it's the very simplest one. Oops. Normally better at these drawings. I put so much effort into this one. I don't have any left for the easy one. So there's your first um, self-respecting link. Of course. Along with the unknot, there's an unlink where you just have two circles sitting uh, apart from each other. And um, links can be interesting in their own right. Um, they can, even though all of the components are knotted, uh, are actually unknotted, like in this link, they can be uh, exhibit some subtle kinds of knotting. So here's another one. Um, so I'll try to. I'm not doing a very terrible job here. I got it. So um, this one is, this one is actually also has a name which has nothing to do with mathematics. It's called the Borromean. There's probably two R's somewhere on the Borromean rings. And it has a magnificent property that it's, it's the kind of way in which these three circles are linked together is rather interesting. If you simply remove one of the circles, then the other two uh, fall apart. Okay, And yet you can't um, sort of pull them apart. Okay, so there's the first... Um, thing about knots. I've been drawing lots of, lots of knots, actually pictures of knots. As you see, they're two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional objects. But um, by evoking the word pulling the strings, of pulling these circles apart, I have started to started to take the first step down to, on the first most fundamental problem of knot theory, which is uh, when are two knots the same? And what I mean by the same is simply that you can deform one into the other by smooth motions in three dimensions, okay? And the point is without cutting the string. You, well, they've got to, it's got to be smooth. You're never allowed to cut the string. So, um, so when I said that the Borobarian rings come apart, if you take one of, the, one of the circles away, then it's obvious what that means. But what does it mean that they don't come apart? Well, that means that no matter how you twist or stretch or smoothly deformed space, you can never transform this picture into uh, one with three uh, disjoint circles, three distant circles. All right, so now we need to go back and rethink uh, with that question in mind, re rethink um, 
from the start. So what about the trefoil? Uh, who's to say that this knot here cannot be deformed so it actually becomes this knot here? All right? That's sort of not obvious. Um, if you make this knot out of string and play around with it, then, you know, after 10 minutes, you will convince yourself that it's impossible. Uh, but, you know, how can you be sure that if you hadn't just been a little bit trickier with it, and <laughs> that you couldn't actually have transformed uh, this one into this one? Or, for that matter, this one into this one? Or this one into this one, or any of these among themselves? Um, one thing is obvious is that you can't transform this one into these ones because it has a different number of components. Okay, So links are immediately different from knots. So that's sort of the, what we might call the fundamental problem of knot theory, which is to, um, to try to distinguish knots, to um, decide when two knots are, are actually different by looking at the pictures of them. And uh, as I said, it's not actually all that easy. And indeed, the, up until the earliest twi early 20th century, there was no proof, uh, which was even vaguely mathematically acceptable, that um, any two knots were different one from another. So as far as anyone knew mathematically, any knot could be deformed into this knot. So that, the first proofs, as I said, that that's impossible came in the beginning of the 20th century. And the, it, the subject of topology uh, grew up with knots as examples, and it contributed to topology, and topology uh, contributed to, to knot theory quite significantly in both directions. Interestingly enough, um, before the, the real mathematics came along, uh, people who got interested in knots, um, and there were big tables of knots. In fact, there were tables of all knots up to 10 crossings. This one has 11, but so th that table, th this knot had not been seen before the uh, late, uh, latter half of the 20th century, but up to all knots up to 10 crossings had actually been looked at, and there's about some 200 of them. Um, and they were all written down, pictures of them in a big table. Okay, but there was no proof that these knots uh, were actually different from each other. You know, I guess, I, whoops. Well, I'm okay. <laughs> so, uh, presumably the people making these tables would just draw the pictures of knots and then try and fiddle with them and had some criterion that if after two hours they couldn't decide that they were different, they would decree them. So it's sort of amazing that the, um, the tables of some 200 knots um, produced with crude methods, in fact, not essentially no methods at all, turned out to be almost entirely correct. There was only one correction, which was, uh, it turned out that the 161st and 162nd knots on the table of 10 crossing knots uh, turned out to be the same. And this was discovered in the 1970s by a New York lawyer, actually, who, um, besides being a lawyer, was interested in knot theory, and he, he, was, he was actually... I'm getting carried away here using up all my time on this story, but that's okay, right? <laughs> uh, he was actually trying to extend the tables from 10 crossings to 11 crossings. So he had to hone some mathematical tools to be able to do this, and he had some new tools to tell knots apart. And he was just to check that they worked well, he checked them on all of the 10 crossing knots, and he found that, try as he might, he was unable to distinguish... 10,161 from 10,162. So finally he decided, well, maybe they're actually the same. Maybe these guys, uh, uh, Tate and company, made a mistake. And in fact, he was able to deform 10,161 to 10,162. So that's a, a very, I think, fascinating uh, story, a little, little bit of, tidbit of uh, mathematics, mathematical history. Right, well... Um, I'm, the, the tack that I'm going to take on this is not going to be uh, basically a, a, a standard topological tack where you would look at uh, basically a, you would define some topological space and look for invariants like homology and fundamental group and so on. Uh, I'm going to take a rather different one, which is, of course, aiming straight at subfactors eventually. <coughs>
Um, and the first step in that, it's, it's a much more combinatorial approach. And as I've said, the thing, this special, really neat thing about two, three dimensions is that you can represent these knots as just two-dimensional pictures. But of course, the picture that you get of a knot is highly non-unique, right? I mean, you could do all kinds of things. I could, I could put in a kink here, like this. Um, I could take this one and run it under that one, or all the way under there. Okay, and you'll see quite visibly that uh, neither of those uh, changes in the picture actually changes the underlying three-dimensional uh, knot that we're talking about. Okay, so the, the, the big advance in this direction was the discovery by Reitermeister of the so-called uh, Reitermeister move. And uh, these are three elementary moves, uh, that which by, that, by move I mean the change in the picture of a knot, uh, and they obviously quite visibly, will not change the underlying knot. So this is how they're presented. They're, there's type one, which is that you take a kink and you remove it. Okay, Or you could go the other way. You might want to uh, insert a kink for perhaps bizarre reasons, but it might help things. Um, type two is this one here. where I um, did exactly that in, in either direction. And then the, the more gutsy one is type 3, which I cleverly have not allowed much room for, but I'll, I think I have enough. Type three right nice to move where I've done something um, the way I've drawn it, I've moved this one, this string at the back, I've moved it past the other crossing. And it's come out here. But if you look at it in different ways, you can see it, see any three of the strings moving if you want to. Okay, so those are um, changes on, on diagrams that clearly do not change the the knot, the underlying knot, right? Visibly, like, I mean, to get this one, for instance, I did two type two Reitermeister moves and the type one Reitermeister move by putting in this kink. Okay, and the theorem of Reitermeister was that if you have two pictures of knots, then they represent the same knot if and only if there is a sequence of type one, type two, or type three Reitermeister moves to go between them, plus. And I want to emphasize this heavily because that's going to be the main thing, thrust towards subfactors. You're allowed to do deformations in the plane, right, that don't change the crossings at all. So I can sort of take this here and I can send it around like that, okay? That changes the picture in the plane, but obviously, you know, it sort of doesn't even change the combinatorics in the plane. But we need to throw it in. So the theorem of Reitermeister moves is theorem... So uh, let me put it this way, not diagrams, modulo planar isotopy and two Reitermeister moves this theory which is obviously just planar combinatorics, we take all these pictures and then we take the equivalence relation given by deforming them just in the plane without changing the crossings at all. And the Reitermeister moves. This is equivalent to knots in three space. So once again, to, to say, say it out loud, this means that any two pictures are pictures of the same knot if and only if there is a sequence of Reitermeister moves and planar isotopies um, which will take you from one to the other. Right. So now, having done this, one can look for uh, invariance. Right. So this opens the door to a whole lot of stuff uh, to do with um, knots, you know, 
proving three-dimensional results by two-dimensional methods, basically. You can look at a picture, and you can look for things that you could do. So, so, I don't know, you know, the sky's the limit. You think you're only bounded by your own imagination in ways that you can write down something coming from this not picture and then try to prove that it doesn't change when you do the, the Rotomeister right most to moves of types one, two, and three. The very simplest of these was actually discovered by Gauss. Um, if, it's in the oriented world, unfortunately, but um, if you orient, the, it's obvious what orientation means. If you orient them, then uh, when you have crossings, they have, uh, uh, when you have orientation, these two crossings are different, and this one's called positive, and this one's called negative. And, um, what you can do is you, if you have a diagram, big diagram of a link, then you can take two components and add up the crossings in between these two components with the sign. This is called the linking number, and it's very easy to check that it just doesn't change under these rotomoisten moves. So the linking number is what's called an invariant of the link. Very simple one, um, but to illustrate the point, that's, that's a, a way to do it. And um, I want now to head towards a, a, uh, another invariant which will uh, play a role, as I said, in the connection with subfactors. And I'm, I'm sort of deliberately reversing the order of time in, the, in what I'm doing here. So, <clears throat> so what we have is, um, as I said, the main thing that, we're, that I've told you so far is that we have knot theory becomes diagrams of knots, modulo, planar isotopy, and write a moisture moves. All right now, I just want to think a little bit more about these write a moisture moves. I, man I think I managed to uh, to completely avoid saying, just appealing to your obvious, you know, intuition, to say what what is really meant by these write a moisture moves. But what was meant was, of course, that um, that they apply sort of locally to a small part of a, a picture of, of a knot, right? If we surrounded this little thing there by a, a little disk, right, then the idea of this type 1 right of to move is, it, is it's supposed to apply inside this disk and then nothing else happens outside it. So this is supposed to be, you know, there's all kinds of garbage sitting outside this disk and it's the same garbage out sitting outside of this disk, right? And that's what it means to apply a right of to move to a knot diagram. And similarly here, this, um, this is how we apply it, a, a type 2 right most to move. Outside this disk, there's stuff, and the same stuff sits outside this disk. So we just locally applied this move. And then, similarly, this one here uh, is, is a local application of a right most to, the right most to move. Okay, everyone clear about that? Sometimes this causes a little confusion, but I think it's fairly obvious. It leads, however, immediately to the consideration of what, what we could call knots with boundary, right? You could say that these pictures are simply knots. They're bits of knots, but you could say that this is a knot that has a boundary, and the boundary in this case is these uh, six points, okay? So knots with boundary. And knots with boundaries were given a name by this gentleman, Conway. He called them tangles. Okay, so now immediately, uh, you know, all of a sudden the subject has become uh, immensely more complicated because we had these nice little knots sitting there and maybe links with several components, but now all of a sudden we have allowed ourselves and, and somehow necessarily allowed ourselves in order to formally talk about these right of we were forced to consider knots with boundary, but once you've got knots with boundary, then what about all knots with boundary, right? I mean, the, we've got these pictures here, but you could take you could then imagine taking um, any uh, knot with boundary. And have any old mess that you like inside it. I'll probably get lost of just doing this. <laughs> 
And I, I must have got lost because there's only three points on the boundary. And one thing, there have to be an even number of points on the boundary. There we go. This one can come over here, and over here, and there. So there's your, you know, you can now imagine your arbitrary tangle. Well, as soon as you've, we've been led to the consideration. So we have the same kind of questions about tangles and the same Rotemeister theorem that two tangles are equivalent as three, this is really a three-dimensional object. They're equivalent uh, if and only if the, you can get from one to the other uh, with the Rotemeister moves in planar isotopy. So here we go. We've augmented the subject of knot theory by the study of tangles. And tangles, you see, have a bit more structure than knots um, because you can do things uh, with the boundary. And the one st structure that I want to bring out right away is um, a multiplication. So I guess the first thing to note about tangles is you, you really want them to know these points on the boundary. It's not, you're not free to just rotate them yet. So there's always sort of got to be a first point. Once you've got a first one, cyclic order takes over. So, um, so that means that you can, since there's an even number, you can always split the number of boundary points up into two and put half of them at the top and half of them at the bottom. And then in between, you have all of your junk, right? So there's a, uh, there's a tangle. Now, once you've done this, once you've done this, and this is your distinguished point here, then you can multiply them together like this, as, as follows. You have another one. Okay. Imagine that this was actually another tangle in here, then you put them together and you've got a, a new tangle, maybe twice as big, but it's, a, you know, it's all up to isotopy anyway, so that you, so that you have an operation on tangles. Uh, it's trivially associative. That's just a matter of drawing the pictures. or well, not even we're just imagining the pictures and looking at it. Uh, it also has an identity. This one that I chose to draw here doesn't change the, the, the underlying tangle. It's isotopy class. So uh, we, what we get in math, math, in math speak is a semi-group uh, with identity. And uh, I've never studied such things, but I believe, aren't they called monoids or something? I don't know. Right, so the fir my first reaction on seeing a multiplication like that is to linearize it and take the vector space of all tangles, um, all, all tangles. So linearizing, let's let C be the arbitrary field given by the complex numbers. So we want C of tangles. So this is linear combinations with coefficients of uh, tangles. Now there's one, notice there's one for each integer because tangles, there's one bunch of tangles for each integer, namely tangles with twice that integer number of boundary points. Okay, and the assertion is that this is a unital algebra. There's an associative multiplication and there's an identity. Okay, and this algebra is going to be, as I said, taking a direct aim at subfactors by defining this algebra. All right. Um. <clears throat> so, very briefly, I want to uh, define a an invariant that can be obtained by this procedure, and, and it's called the Jones polynomial, and it was. I guess discovered by me, um, completely reversing the direction of the talk that, I, that I'm giving. So you'll find out to find out how I discovered it. You need to start at the end of the talk and then uh, go back. So, but this is what it became after a little bit of mucking around. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a C of tangles. And there's a, let me just put an N there. So N is supposed to be, uh, let, uh, let be reasonable, N tangles. So N is tangles with two N boundary points. So uh, the ones that I described had one, two, three, four at the top, four at the bottom, so that's four tangles. And then uh, we're going to define it by, we, what we're going to do is, uh, is mod out by a certain relation in this algebra of tangles. And the relation is, I'm going to slip in an orientation also, 
it's uh, 1 over t times this uh, uh, minus t times this uh, plus root t minus 1 over root t minus times this. So t is a sum up sum number. And um, so I'm simply going to take this vector space uh, of tangles and I'm going to mod out by uh, this relation. Okay, this is just uh, saying that such a tangle is zero. And of course, this is to be understood as you apply this locally just as we did the Rademeister moves. So maybe you can see these three these three pictures surrounded by the same junk, then the, the, the elements in this algebra have to be the same, All right? And uh, the theorem saying that the Jones polynomial exists is simply the result that the dimension of the zero tangle space is one. Theorem. This same relation, this is zero, is equal to one. What does, it, what does this mean? This means, think about this. We take a single knot and we allow ourselves to apply Reitermeister moves and this skein relation. We've got to end up being a multiple of one thing. Okay, that multiple, and the one thing that's, that's always there is this one here. So you get any any knot or link diagram being a multiple of this, and this is the Jones polynomial of the knot. Okay. Now I could convince you relatively easily that uh, this reduction uh, is, is is by induction that this reduction is uh, is possible that this re relationship here suffices to calculate the Jones polynomial. That's just by a simple induction. You basically cunningly reduce the number of crossings until you get no crossings at all, and therefore you're a multiple of the uh, trivial knot. Uh, but let me just save some time and skip that and um, move on to bigger and better things. Um, an improvement on this theorem, just before I leave it, is that the dimension, you may ask, well, what's, this is all very well, the dimension of the zero tangles is one, What's the dimension of the entangles? Modulo this relation. So, out of interest, do any of you know the answer to this? No one, okay. Here it is. It's one of n plus one, two n choose n. There's famous uh, numbers called the Catalan numbers. And the, re re the reason is completely obvious if you think about it. It's just what I said, that by uh, manipulating the, the Rotemeister moves and this move, you can get rid of crossings. So you end up reducing any tangle, any tangle at all, this one, for instance, get rid of all the crossings, and what you're left off with is simply a pairing of the boundary points. And it's, it's known that these numbers, the Catalan numbers, are well known to count this kind of planar uh, connections here. So there you go. Uh, one more thing before I leave knots. Um, right. I just, I, I just want to point out what I've, what I've been uh, trying to ram home. Um, I don't know how successfully or not, but the, the, the sort of equivalence between uh, the Rodemeister moves and this thing here. I've really had this just up to this linearization. That relation is really just nothing but the same. Morally, it's morally the same as the Rodemeister moves. So it's as if we had one, two, three, four Rodemeister moves, although you need to linearize. You need to take linear combinations to apply this. But other than that, they're the same. And so you could actually 
say this to make it even more combinatorial so that you're sort of not fooled by thinking these really are three-dimensional. You, well, you could say, well, let's even forget, um, forget to make our diagrams look like that. Let's just put any old thing inside here. We'll take a disk with three points, with four points on the boundary. We'll put, I don't know, some spaghetti, no, so an ice cream or a samba school or something like that. Just put it in there. And we'll call the samba school, we'll call it R. Right? And then we could convert all of these moves into things with, we just replace all of these crossings by R's, uh, being careful about how we do it because of the over and under. And we find that the knot theory has simply become planar combinatorics with samba schools, okay? Because we just put them, put them all over the place and we've forgotten whether it was an overcrossing, whatever it was. It was just these sort of planar tangles with no crossings, and then in the, inside these planar tangles we've got these R's. So this is what a knot has become. Yeah. Okay. So just to, so that we've, we've, we've gone, you know, as I said, the, what history did was it started with knot theory and, and applied topology, and topology applied it, and so on. We've done exactly the opposite thing. We have said, forget topology, I want to go into two dimensions and make everything combinatorial. I've even removed the nice pictures. All of the crossings of the three-dimensional intuition that you might want have gone. They've just become these R's, these little symbols. Okay? All right, end of, end of spiel on, uh, on knot theory. Now I just want to talk about, for a, briefly, I'm going to have to cut very short one of my three topics. And the, the next thing I want to talk about is three manifolds. Um, it's probably wise that I cut that one short because that's the one I know least about. But um, I certainly want to say something about it anyway be for the following reason. Uh, we are often asked as mathematicians about, you know, well, look, you're studying these strange objects and, and um, you know, what good are they in the real world, okay? What good are they in the real world? And, uh, you know, it's tough. It's tough to answer this because most of the time... Uh, if I was talking about von Neumann algebras or uh, rings or, or PDE even, uh, it might be actually hard to, well, some PDEs be okay, but maybe the one that I'm working on, it might be actually be hard to, to explain to the person that you're talking to what the, possibly this could have to do with, with, with reality. And the same thing uh, happens with knots. Uh, unfortunately, there are a couple of answers. One is a bit shaky, which is this theory of vortex atoms that I alluded to where... Uh, this was the reason that people made these knot tables. The idea was that um, we lived in the ether, and the ether got tied, tied, up, tied up into little whirlpools, little vortices, and that knots would explain the Mendeleev's periodic table of the elements. Okay, well, nice theory, but it turned out to be a bit wrong. Um, however, interestingly enough, knots came along uh, with a vengeance in the early 1980s with the study of DNA, because DNA is a long, flexible molecule, and as anyone who's been, ever been fishing knows, uh, long, flexible stuff will get itself tied up into knots. And this can be a problem for uh, this, for life, actually, because you know, sometimes these knots have to get untied. When a cell divides, this knotty mess that gets created by the division of DNA molecules has to actually separate into two identical copies in the, in the daughter cells. So, you know, and, and knot theory the knot theory that mathematicians had done turned out to be extremely useful uh, for biologists. In fact, I have a quote from a biologist friend of mine uh, who was leading the attack, and he said that um, when finally he got put in touch with the right mathematicians, it solved 90% of his problems overnight. So that's a big plus for us mathematicians. Uh, maybe a little bit of exaggeration, but it's a great quote, and it is a, it is a genuine quote. He said that. So there you go. But, you know, so if you're asked this question, what good is not theory, then you can give a genuine answer that it is genuinely useful and interesting and important in, in biology and, and sort of life. So that's great. On the other hand, on the other hand, we're mathematicians. What we're secretly, what we're really interested in is what knots have to do with other parts of mathematics and how that all ties up. And the part of mathematics where knots come in in a big way is the study of three manifolds. And I just want to say a few words about how that happens rather than giving, I mean, it would be, 
uh, even exhausting my knowledge would take a couple of lectures, so um, I'll just be very quick about it. So, th uh, so I'm talk the kind of manifolds I'm talking about is compact, connected three manifolds. So <clears throat> that was the reason that at the beginning of the lecture I said take S3 rather than R3, I want to be compact and connected. So three manifolds. Once again, uh, by the three manifold, I mean compact and connected and oriented as well. Who cares? I mean, it's too bad that the impa, the impa sign is, happens to be unoriented, but not much difference really between oriented and, and unoriented, so it won't bother with that very much. So we're talking uh, compact connected three manifolds, and the question is um, how can you get them and how can you manipulate them? Well, if we were talking about two manifolds, the story would be quite short. Um, although the theorem to prove that the assertion would be quite long. But um, for two manifolds, we know that any compact-oriented two-manifold is simply the two-sphere uh, to which one has added a certain number of handles, right? So we take the two-sphere and then just add a handle to it, which we all learn to draw at some point like that. And then we add another handle. So on. And simply the number of handles tells you exactly uh, which two manifold you've got. And all, any two manifold is actually um, diffeomorphic to one of these. Okay. Well, the story in three dimensions is much more complicated. And we don't have any simple list of all three manifolds, but we do have this magnificent way of constructing them and manipulating them, which is, which is so called Dane surgery on knots. So if we take a knot, um, any knot, even the unknot produces some non-trivial examples here, then Dane surgery says do the following. We, the, the knot that we started out with was this infinitely thin, infinitely flexible object, but we take a so-called tubular neighborhood of it, we thicken it up a bit. So, well... I can do this. I can cheat here. Okay, so this is a, a tube going all around the knot. Now, what is that tube? Abstractly, that tube is just a, a two-torus, isn't it? It's a solid two-torus. I mean, it happens to be embedded in a funny way into three space by the knot, but, it, you know, if you just think about it, all it is is a long tube with its inside there. So then, now what we're going to do is we're going to take our three-dimensional scissors and we're going to cut out the inside. We're going to remove the inside of that tube. So I, I guess you could do that. I mean, this is the surgery, but right, you could imagine these days that that's what a surgeon is. He somehow goes in there and then he r removes the inside of this solid torus. So what we're left with is a three-manifold. Do not come... Well, it is... It, it's, it has a boundary to it, right? It has a boundary to it, which is this torus, this two-dimensional torus. Then we simply take that inside that we've removed, we do a diffeomorphism to it, and then glue it back in. So we just glue it back in. And who knows? We may have changed, when we, when we glued it back in smoothly and so on, we may have changed the, the uh, structure of the three-dimensional manifold that we're looking at. So we could have started in the three-sphere, started in S3, taken a knot like this, gouged out the middle, the, 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 gouged out the inside of that tube, stuck it back in, but after doing some diffeomorphism, and we may well have changed our, when we get a new smooth three manifold, and, and it may be quite different from the one that we got, some other three manifold. Okay, and uh, even if we do this on the unknot and some very simple, uh, simple diffeomorphisms, we get we can get what's called uh, what people know as the lens spaces. Of course, the great way to um, understand these things a little bit is to apply the tools of algebraic topology. You know, homology and homotopy and fundamental group, of the theorems, the Mayer-Vitoris theorem, and so on, that are just made for this kind of operation. So you can figure out how homology and the fundamental group uh, from the Van Kampen theorem change when you do 
this kind of operation. So you can convince yourself very easily that you've actually produced, you started from the three sphere and you've produced a three manifold. And depending on the knot and how you do the diffeomorphism, it may be a very different three manifold. Okay, so that's surgery on knots and of course on links. If you had more than one component, you could do the same thing for every component. You could just gouge out the this tube and then glue it back in. Okay, it's a fundamental theorem of Licorice and Wallace that any three manifold can be obtained in this way. Right, so now we, you see, we're, we're interestingly enough, we're in the situation that we were in very early on with knots. We have this collection of all three manifolds, and then we have this sort of combinatorial description of it. And we have any three manifold is actually can be thought of as being a link together with the instructions of how to do the surgery on the link. Okay? So what was the killer for the knots? It was the Rodemeister moves. We, the Reutemeister moves said any two pictures of the same knot are related by a sequence of Reutemeister moves. Well, the analogous thing for three manifolds, we want a theorem that says any two three manifolds, any two surgery descriptions of three manifolds are the same three manifold if and only if there is, first of all, obviously diffeomorphisms in R3 or S3 uh, or the ambient stuff, plus some moves, and these moves are, are the Kirby moves after my colleague and, of, and for quite a while office neighbor in Berkeley, uh, Rob Kirby. So I'm not going to tell you what, the, what they are simply because of time. I actually prepared uh, what I, I you know, made sure I know what they are. They're a bit more complicated than the Rodemeister moves. They're much more difficult to visualize. Um, but I'll just tell you that morally, they, are the, they play the same role in this theory in the theory of three manifolds, as the Rodemeister moves do in knot theory. They tell you exactly when two pictures, um, two surgery pictures of a three manifold are the same. And um, so you can search for, you could, if you wanted to, search for invariance of three manifolds by looking at pictures of knots, you know, links with the surgery description, with the surgery data for every component of the link, to, given the diffeomorphism. And one of the uh, events in the late 20th century, in 1988, Witten, in a famous paper, uh, showed that you can actually combine, if you put, I, I talked about this Jones polynomial, and if you put t equal to e to the 2 pi i of n, this particular root of unity, he showed that if you, add up values of the Jones polynomial appropriately on the, on the link, and uh, uh, then you get an invariant of three manifolds. So Witten did not so much um, show this as he predicted it. I mean, uh, there was a, a long physics reasoning, uh, and he came out with the conclusion at the end, that, but a, a very explicit formula for what would be a an invariant of the three manifold. And this is this was verified by Reshetikin, Turayev, Kirby Melvin, and other people. And uh, it should be called the probably called the Witten invariant of the of the three manifold. All right, so that's that's a quick look at three manifolds. And now finally I want to come to the first part of the talk. Um, <laughs> in the next I don't know how many minutes I have, maybe about ten minutes. Uh, and uh, tell you about subfactors. Okay. Well, normally I would have to start with a with a very different tack. I would have to go off and talk about Hilbert space and bounded operators on Hilbert space and so on and so forth. But I prepared this in a completely and utterly different direction. So this will possibly be the first time that this has been given as a definition of a subfactor. It's not. Uh, it has to be taken with a small grain of salt. There, it's certainly true with a few uh, extra caveats, but I'm just going to uh, assert it as, as a definition. And it's going to be a subfactor. 
is a generalization of a not invariant. Okay? And I'm going to explain in what sense it's a generalization. Subfactor. All right, so I'm gonna, I have to tell you um, sort of what I'm talking about here, right? So in what sense is it general, gen, generalizing it? Well, as I said, I've prepared the ground fairly carefully with my Samba schools because I said that you could actually replace knots. You could actually replace knots entirely by these pictures, these pictures in the plane. These pictures in the plane where the crossings are all gone and they're just there's some things that you put inside which I being in Rio have referred to as samba schools, they could be anything, they could be elephants. Um, but, uh, So right, we, we knew how to interpret the, we, we knew what to do for, to get a knot from this. We just put in crossings. But now I'm saying don't put in crossings. Just let these things be anything. And once they're anything, there's no particular reason why they should have only four points as a boundary. So we could have another couple of points here. And if we have two for one, we've got to have two for all. Or we could have, oops, I think I'm stuck here, right? Well, we could have different R's with, with different um, numbers of boundary points. Okay? So I'm saying we now want to consider, as a generalization of knots, it's kind of weird because three dimensions are out of it, I want to consider all such pictures. Okay? But, I mean, that's just stupid, right? Considering all such pictures, I've got to do something with it. So I'm going to learn from knot theory, and I say, what did we want to do if we wanted this have to do with anything else, we had to quotient by some moves, namely the Reitermeister moves, the first instance, and in the second instance, by this so-called skein relation that we had there. Remember that funny thing that I did to get the Jones polynomial? So I'm going to try to, to, to consider such things uh, modulo skein relations. But in fact, I don't even have to do that. I, can, I, I realize that quite late in the preparing this talk that there's a trick that allows me to get there even better. All I need is the invariant. So I define, as I did before, a, an entangle, an entangle to just be some one of these things with boundary. Okay, so an entangle. on R, S, and so on. So these are the various Samba schools or elephants or whatever you want them to be. Uh, is simply a linear combination, or at least a linearized entangle, is going to be a, a sum of pictures with these points on the boundary in R, S, and T connected together in some planar fashion inside with coefficients. So just imagine an arbitrary linear combination of these tangles, right, where you don't have any crossings. Instead of crossings, you have these R's, S, and T's. Right, and I'm going to suppose that I have an invariant of those. That's what a subfactor is. A subfactor. <coughs> 
Now the term is loaded. It's some fact that there's somehow this von Neumann algebra is around and so on, which I'm, which I'm completely hiding. But what that, the role of that at this point is it's not just any invariant. It has to be an invariant with some, some properties. And there's, there's, amazingly enough, there's only going to be two properties. Two properties. One of them is a positivity property. Namely, uh, we can get a sesquilinear form. On, uh, I, haven't, I need to give it a name. An entangle on R, S, and T. So I need to have a name. What I need to have is a name for this object. Entangles on R, S, and T. R on these number schools. So let's call it something. J for Rio de Janeiro, right, J, Jn. So what I can do, so that, remember, so an element of Jn is a, is a linear combination, formal linear combination of pictures, and I can define a sesquilinear form on Jn, which is x, y. Suffices, since it's spanned by these pictures, it suffices to define it on pictures, x and y. What I do is I take x and I take y, and I join them up like so. And I've got now a zero tangle. I've got one of these things, and I have as an invariant of, general, of these generalized, generalized knots. Sorry. I've ended up with a generalized knot. There's no boundary, so I've got a number. So this gives me a, I, I need to, actually, I'll take the mirror image of this one. Take the mirror image one. This gives me a sesquilinear form on Jn. Axiom one. It's positive semi-definite. I.e. X, X is greater than or equal to zero. And axiom two is whenever you have a sesquilinear form, you can take the quotient by the kernel. The axiom two is simply that that is finite dimensional. Quotient. All right, so now I've sort of run out of time. Um, I'll have to leave it to uh, my next lecture to fill you in on how this fits in with other points of view and definitions of subfactor, in particular loop groups and conformal field theory. But let me just say um, examples of such, of course, the trivial examples are given by knot theory, right? The Jones polynomial at these roots of unity supplies examples of these subfactors. Historically, it was the other way around. The subfactors supplied the, the non-invariants. But the lesson is that there are lots, lots more. There's a vast number of subfactors that appear to have little or nothing to do with knot theory. So if you like, there's other kinds of relations, like the Reutemeister moves and the skein theory relation. There's lots of other relations around that I can draw pictures of, which cause these axioms to be satisfied, the positive definiteness and the quotient, the finite dimensional collapse of these infinite, potent, potentially infinite dimensional things. They arise all over the place. Knot theory is just one of them, and in some sense there's an embarrassment of riches because we don't know what to do in some sense with all of these other ones. They're all out there, and I hope to uh, tell you next time uh, something about other contexts, in particular contexts in physics in which they arise. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So I'll open the floor for questions and comments. But uh, before I forget, uh, we'll have uh, a cocktail after the lecture outside here. Uh, next Wednesday, same time, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there will be a talk, a second talk by Bogan on subfactors, exactly what he started today. <laughs>
loop groups and conformal field theory that takes uh, uh, us directly into mathematical physics. Okay, questions and comments? Please. Okay, well, thanks for a very nice talk. I was wondering, uh, it seems that people in graph theory have connected with this. Uh, could you give us some leads about connections to graph theory and how uh, these would uh, also? Right, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, up to, you know, a bit of extra structure, what we're talking about here are uh, graphs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some special types of graphs. But some very special types of graphs, planar graphs, okay? So, in some sense, what I'm saying is, was a big surprise to me. I mean, this came you know, that that somehow planar graphs are incredibly, as an incredibly rich area. And the the main witness to this, of course, is the four color theorem. Um, as you know, uh, it is true, but it's only it's, it's only known by people's computers that any uh, planar graph can be four colored. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, the the reason that the, the the way this is proved is you get all these you know millions and millions of different cases, and you show that in every one of these cases the the not the existence of a minimal cap example leads to a contradiction. And the, the but the point is the kind of arguments that are used are very much like these skein theoretic arguments. So it, it seems uh, um, is what the picture is looking like at the moment is is is, is that this whole vast number of you know, non-existent potential counterexamples have to develop some skein theory for each one. To each one of those, we can turn its non-existence into a sub factor. Oh my God. Yeah. So all of that um, embarrassment of you know, complexity and difficulty in proving the four color theorem, we just throw all these things away. Every single one of those should have its own life and have a theory like the Rhino Master moves in the skein theory. So that's the picture that's emerging from this 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 thing. So that's you know that's fantastic, I think. And so this sort of planar combinatorics of graphs and, and, and things that are a bit richer than graphs um, is you know will keep us going for another century <laughs> at least in, in trying to get to the bottom. And of course, it's related to so many other things. There's the physics and, yeah. and you know there's the statistical mechanics and knot theory and so on. So you know. The loop groups. Are you ever willing to give up semi definite? Is the stick, uh, loud. Loud. So okay. Also, uh, sure. You are connected to the whole country. Oh, okay. Don't well, scare worried? me yeah. any further. <laughs> the on, on your axioms there, semi definite is, is that a crucial role? I mean, uh, can, okay. So that's a this is a good question. Also, the semi the semi definiteness. As, we'll, as I wanted to see in the, in the remaining 10 minutes of my talk, allows you to construct a Hilbert space. Okay, if you didn't have that, you couldn't construct the Hilbert space. But you know, the, what, from that point of view, the really crucial axiom is this one. Simply, if you take the quotient by the kernel, if you just have a form has a kernel, things orthogonal to everything, and the quotient by that has to be finite dimensional. Once you've got that, you're in business in terms of having a, an interesting theory with invariance of something. You know these knots, hyper knots, whatever they are. Um, and but this is the positivity is the icing of the cake. It allows you to put it on Hilbert space and get operated for Neumann algebras and so on, and uh, connect with um, physics directly because Hilbert space quantum mechanics and so on. The other thing is that you p might not have the theorems. There was a theorem at the end of the day, which was going to be the end of the talk, was that once you have the subfactor. Which ends up being an algebra and a subalgebra somewhere. Okay, you can actually just from that data reconstruct all of the the not the, not in, the generalized not invariant, the sort of deep mathematical theorem. Now, I'm not sure to what extent um, you would have that if you threw away positive semi definiteness. There might there's, there's probably a context in which it's still true, a very, but a very algebraic context. I'm thinking of this construction going back to Krein, and maybe this is tied up with George's.
linear system, electrical engineer. Yeah. I, would, I think Crane managed through a number of things where he gave up semi definitely There may be some. Yeah, there may. Be, I mean, uh, you know, I just have this prejudice in favor of Hilbert space and positive definiteness. But, you know, if, if you lose that prejudice, then the main action is this one, the finite dimensionality. You know, it's quite remarkable. I can give you another set of like, very simple um, set of pictures that, that produce this finite dimensional collapse, and I could even prove it to you. So these will be pictures that look a bit like the Rotomeister moves, but they're not. Here it is. Um, So this is in the world where the Samba schools all have um, four legs. So suppose you have, uh, in the, let me do it, just suppose there's one kind of Samba school like that. And if this is a linear combination of that and that, so this work that was first done by Dietmar Bisch and myself and also uh, Zef Landau, um, and you just do this formal big vector space of tangles, huge infinite dimensional thing, quotient it out by this single relation, it collapses down to finite dimensions. So, but, you know, what, what is this? If you put in crossings in, in here, it makes no sense at all um, in terms of not theory. But it's a beautiful world and it exists and it has, even has this positive definite. Uh, please, more... Uh questions or comments. So uh, let's thank uh, Bogan Jones for his very beautiful and very broad uh, uh, lecture. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank and uh, so next Wednesday we'll uh, have him again. <laughs>